Autodesk integration. That's what I was told yesterday, late afternoon, that I'd be talking about. So hopefully I got some stuff put together for you. We are going to talk about integration. Uh, my name is Jack Hobson, so I do technical solutions for utilities at Autodesk, assisting the account managers with their various accounts across North America with whatever your technical needs are. So helping you figure out workflow, uh, you know, technology paths. I pull in technical experts where it's necessary. Uh, again, just to uh, help you guys as a utility base. A little bit about my background. Um, over 20 years ago, I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do. And I figured I'd either be an auto mechanic or uh, I'd go into the theater. When I asked my parents uh, what my college fund looked like, they said zero. So I had to figure something out. So I ended up, uh, when I was not on stage in high school, I actually did AutoCAD work for Scenic Design, and I had no idea that I could actually make a living at it. So I went to school, got an associate's in applied science, um, ended up with a degree, and found myself in telecommunication distribution. So we used Map3D to map out fiber optic and radio frequency design for a company called Charter Communications. Maybe you heard of it. So I was there for a few years, went to go work for a company called CenturyTel, where we did fiber optic design and pop rack sites from various companies that were acquired over the years. And then uh, the college I actually graduated from asked me to come back and teach. So I taught 3D design for a few years, got a couple other degrees uh, with the intention of getting out of the design world. But uh, there was a job posting at the local utility uh, in my town, St. Louis, Missouri, where I'm from. And they were looking for a design supervisor that had business acumen so they could uh, deal with the union and negotiate contracts, agreements, things of that nature. So I found myself roped back really into design, not that I really left, but it really has been such a privilege to work in this industry, uh, being able to just touch various types of design, architecture, manufacturing, utilities. So I worked in substation design for nine years, but I also CAD managed the distribution groups, gas electric uh, generation as well, heavy underground, transmission line design. So I hit a lot of that over the nine to 10 years that I was there. We had a successful pilot for substation design and uh, went to go work for SBS for a few years uh, before I found myself here uh, at Autodesk. This is in fact my first pub. Uh, I did try to get here a few years back, but my previous employer would not approve my travel request. So <laughs> I think Pat was trying to save Louisville for me or me from Louisville. I'm not really sure, but when our friends at uh, Kentucky uh, were showing the map yesterday, I was trying to figure out if that was the damage I did last weekend on my bourbon trip. So some legal stuff to just get out of the way first, our safe harbor statement, a uh, bunch of fancy lawyer talk, but essentially what that means is if I do talk about product features that might be in the next release or we have on a roadmap, do not make purchasing decisions based on that. Only purchase products that are released now because we kick features down the road, we move them from different products. Uh, so again, do not make purchasing decisions if I happen to talk about something uh, as far as future development goes. So I'm gonna turn this real somber for a second. Anybody remember this guy, George Carlin? Comedian, yeah, passed away about 2009. George had this bit that he called the world without electricity. Now, this is paraphrased because George really likes to use colorful language. But essentially, this is what he said. This civilization of ours that we are so proud of, have you ever stopped to realize just how fragile it is? Can you see how easy it is to break down? Wouldn't take but two years to throw us back in the barbaric times. That's all it would take, two years. All you'd have to do is eliminate electricity. No electricity, no lights. So we're back to candles, fires, and lanterns. Batteries couldn't be recharged. Generators couldn't be refueled because fuel's pumped electrically, by the way, so is water. So no lights, no fuel, no water, no computers. And computers run everything. George goes on to paint a lot more of a bleak picture. If you have time during lunch, go to YouTube and watch the whole thing. But it is not to set you off on a bad tone. The reason I say this is because what everyone does in this room is so essential to the quality of life of our civilization. So power, you need that for water. You need that for natural gas. The internet we're enjoying today, the Netflix you might watch tonight, all that stuff is derived from power. And I say this to emphasize the importance of the work that each and every one of you do. Nothing to my friends that design Nike tennis shoes. I love tennis shoes, but if tennis shoes disappeared tomorrow, I could probably go on with my life and survive. If electricity disappeared, that would have a major impact. Your power ever go out? And then, you know, 10 minutes later, you go to flip the light switch and then you're like, oh, duh, the power's out. That's how used to we're having this 24 hours a day, seven days a week. 
So before we talk about integration, I have some milestones I want to talk about. Specifically, we had a 40th birthday this year, which is pretty incredible. So 1982, you know, the developers that created AutoCAD were able to draw a line circle in an arc. They broke out the champagne, called it AutoCAD. Not a lot of software companies, you know, have been around for 40 years. Some of them have went out of business. A lot of them get acquired, name changes. So that's a, that's a really neat thing. And then we're coming up on six years with this technology partnership from SBS. And when you start looking at things like AUD and SDS and just the amount of development that's happened over the last six years, I was working at the utility still when this partnership happened. And you know, to be honest with you, I, I was fairly concerned. I just worked out a big IT service agreement with Autodesk and you know I was kind of panicked a little bit. Dwayne Gidry called to introduce himself. I'm like, I got some problems, Dwayne. <laughs> I got to get this contract done. I got to get this pilot finished. And we got it all worked out and it's been great ever since. And then, as Dennis said yesterday, we're on this five-year anniversary uh, in Autodesk University 2017 uh, where Esri and Autodesk decided to partner because, boy, it had been adversarial, not just from a software company perspective, but you guys as designers and how you work with GIS people and no GIS will do this, no you know, CAD will do that. I remember having this argument 20 years ago when we were looking at um, ArcGIS at Charter Communications and there was this big discussion of, okay, well, we have everything in Map 3D, so now do we move it to ArcGIS and why do we do that? The drawing tools at the time, I thought Microsoft Paint probably did a better job. So it was decided that uh, you know we would do fiber design in ArcGIS and all the complicated RF distribution design would be done in Map 3D. So it's good that this has happened because it's making our lives so much easier as designers when we build the infrastructure of the future. And we all know it's falling apart. Like the stuff needs to get upgraded and squabbling over this type of thing is just hindering our ability to get this stuff done faster and more cost efficient. So this whole idea of integrating BIM and it's feeding GIS information and GIS is fueling BIM. And this wheel looks a little bit different depending on what industry you're in. So, you know, it may not mimic one architecture piece for manufacturing, so on and so forth. But again, essentially this is the idea. And as Joey mentioned yesterday, BIM really just is a fancy word for data. It's just data that you derive from planning, design, building, and how you operate and maintain. And then you go back and doing brownfield work and hopefully starting with that digital twin. So BIM really is the backbone of that digital transformation. So if you were looking at it from a linear perspective, all the things that take place in that. So if that's content management, how we're dealing with that, workflow automation, how we're capturing data out in the field. So if that's reality capture, uh, you know, LIDAR scanning, however that is, uh, and how we're going to visualize and optimize that. And then, of course, you know, this big ladder of 3D, 4D, 5D, and so on. And I always argued, you know, 2D to me was always a, you know, digital twin, <laughs> not a sophisticated one, but it is a digital twin. So I always kind of think of how powerful do you want your digital twin? Do you want models with just attributes that could be derived? Do you want internet of things with sensors where you're clicking on assets and giving you that live feedback of what's actually happening with that asset out in the field? So here is, and again, we're gonna kind of fumble through the video piece here. I'm gonna kick my audio back up and I'm gonna run this video. There are many notable twins in the world today. You might even be a twin. But do you know what a digital twin is? Essentially, it's a digital version of a physical object, a dynamic, up-to-date digital replica of a built asset or environment. With the help of building information modeling, artificial intelligence, machine learning, and Internet of Things technology, data from the original asset is used to build and improve the digital twin. By providing a precise, up-to-date model of its original, a digital twin can help designers, engineers, contractors, owners, and manufacturers create more efficient structures. Digital twins can help with everything from planning, design, and construction to operations and maintenance. Consider a building that's already been designed and constructed. Imagine there's a digital twin of the entire facility, from the roof to the HVAC to the mechanical, engineering, and plumbing systems. Now, imagine that sensors in the building provide the digital twin with real-time information. The digital twin updates itself according to the data. Then, building owners can view areas where the building is aging or faulty and make improvements. 
On a greater scale, multiple digital twins can be integrated in an entire ecosystem. By helping professionals gain more insight into the inner workings of the world, digital twins are becoming partners in building a better future. Official uh, marketing piece on digital twin. So when I begin to think about digital twin, particularly with utilities, boy, when you get into this underground stuff, it gets pretty nasty, right? I mean, it's like a rat's nest of piping and conduit, sewers, lines, and you know, being able to actually digitally model this stuff out becomes very advantageous knowing what's underground. And of course, all the other features that we have, not, I mean, this is a nice model. I mean, it's been run through 3D Max, it's been really rendered highly, uh, but again, having digital twins such as cities, right? How we design the infrastructure underground. So this is InfraWorks with some AUD plugged in. But again, the idea that not only is this gonna really help you during design, but pre-design, but also when you're dealing with cities and counties and really trying to give them the understanding of what you're trying to accomplish. There's really no better way to do that when you are actually working with the digital data and doing modeling information as well. I'll let this last bit run only because I like seeing palm trees in front of substations. So a little piece I made for APS a few years ago, or some of the innovative stuff like uh, our friends that used to be at Anchorage, Aaron over here, him and I were catching up yesterday. Uh, but some of the great stuff they did years ago with LIDAR scanning and incorporating AUD with that for some of these more tricky jobs, right? So when there's highway expansions, there's existing infrastructure, they have to move poles and lines. This is a great ability to say, hey, let's go out and capture this stuff with LIDAR. Let's incorporate AUD data, overlap that. And it just becomes a lot more uh, feasible to accomplish things when you have those reference points of point clouds out in the field. Or again, what we're doing with standards, right? So a lot of you probably have an old standards book with all your pole standards in there. And we have utilities now that are saying, hey, let's model this stuff out. Let's have 3D PDFs and be able to create sheet sets quick. And, and as Dave Wilbur talked about yesterday, you know, now we can take these inventor models and piece them into AUD from right from your standards group. Um, so again, just a lot of neat opportunity uh, as we move into having these models and these digital twins. So on the... ArcGIS side of things with our partnership. The Autodesk Connector for ArcGIS, you know, the capabilities of this have really just expounded over the last few years. Being able to bring that Esri data such as, you know, property lines, streets, waterways, um, you know, whatever data you have within your ArcGIS. And of course, SBS's Utility Data Hub kind of fitting in that puzzle piece of bringing in your actual utility data assets into ArcGIS and, and back into AUD. And then earlier this year, uh, we uh, saw that Esri released an ArcGIS GeoBIM product. And like most things, the architecture industry was the first one to kind of put its arms around it and do some testing. And it's this concept of outside of design when you're working with GIS and you're working with BIM and CAD, taking this stuff up to the cloud, right? So ArcGIS online, Autodesk Construction Cloud, having your assets on the map during construction. So that's pulling in things like Civil 3D, Revit, InfraWorks data. And then of course, ArcGIS Pro, site scanning, field map data back into Autodesk Construction Cloud. And this is really where the integration really starts to fuel itself. So when we look at Autodesk Construction Cloud, uh, we have five major modules for this, in my opinion. There's a BIM Collaborate Pro, but I just lumped those in the same ones. But Docs, Build, Takeoff, BIM Collaborate Pro, and we recently released the uh, Bridge module for this as well. So again, courtesy of SBS here, uh, incorporating the actual construction data up into uh, ACC so we can look at this from a 2D perspective and distribution. But not only that, uh, click on 3D. Once we rotate it, we see that it's built on a civil surface. We can look underground. And again, this just becomes more powerful when we have people building this infrastructure out in the field. And of course, distribution doesn't certainly stop there. We have substations as well, right? So if we're modeling our substations, creating 2D sheet sets of that, not only doing the review in-house, but also the markups out in the field. So as an example here, here is uh, an FBX file of a 3D substation out of Inventor. So right through the browser, you're actually able to look at that 3D model. And, uh, you know, we can zoom in, uh, you know, we can look around. And then, of course, more importantly, is the 2D sheet sets that come from that. And that should pop up here in a second. 
So if I uh, click open a 2D sheet set, so again, whether I'm doing a review in the office or whether I'm actually out in the field doing the markup, uh, I can zoom into the browser or the plan grid app. Uh, I can, you know, do that markup. So if it says nine foot, nine inches, and it's actually 10, I can simply do a markup tool. So whether that's using the tool set within the browser or you're actually using your Apple pen to mark that out freehand. And then transmission, you know, there's some things going on here. Uh, a lot of you guys probably send stuff out to, you know, be machined and built. And, you know, we have a couple customers doing stuff at Inventor with our transmission towers as well. So, again, having these 2D sheet sets that are created from the 3D model. And then, of course, uh, as we're plugging through this 2D uh, sheet set here with an isometric, we can go and look at the 3D model as well. Click on the 3D model. And I can look at that and take measurements and information on that as well. And a little hardware tip, the Microsoft Surface Mouse, great for traveling, not great for CAD work. Zooming in and out is a little bit tricky when I was creating this video. And then, of course, generation. I can't tell you how many customers we have that open up Plant 3D and they're just drawing 2D line circles and arcs. They're not harnessing the intelligent PNIDs, creating 3D models based on that. Um, and again, all incorporates with Autodesk Construction Cloud, how this all integrates. So when you have to do things like RFIs, which is being displayed behind me, you know, that stuff is fairly seamless when you create it. All the people that are assigned to that project get notified that there's been an RFI request. Now, with the Autodesk Construction Cloud, we have a couple pilots going on. And I thought it'd be worth talking about because what was interesting is a lot of you guys have Vault and, and most of our customers, you know, are very protective of their data, rightfully so. So they said, well, how do we work with Autodesk Construction Cloud and the files and consultants? And it led to this very interesting conversation because a lot of utilities, they use VPNs, obviously, whether it's through ThinClient, whether they're using Vault Mobile to access the data. Uh, and then when it comes to consultants, quite often they're checking files out of Vault and then they're sending them to consultants and the utility doesn't really know what's happening after that until the files come back. Now we have a new product called Vault Gateway that circumvents VPN for security. I'm not gonna talk about that today, but um, it is a really neat feature that a couple of our utility customers are looking to adopt. So really what we kind of thought was, okay, we have the vault that's in our server on our systems. Let's think of Autodesk Construction Cloud and Docs specifically kind of as the lockbox. So the workflow theory is that we have all these files in Vault, so whether that's DWGs, Revit, Inventor files, FBX, we check those files out into Docs. So that's our holder. So in Autodesk Construction Cloud, you can assign users and grant various levels of access. So if you have a consultant firm, you list those particular team members, they have access to that project. Now, what's really neat is you can separate the versioning on that project from the actual state record that's held in Vault. Or you can connect them, but the idea being is, okay, we have this system of record in Vault. We have versioning tracking within the project in Autodesk Construction Cloud. Once the project is finished, obviously the project is saved in ACC. It's closed out, but the files go back as a system of record in Vault. So the only people that have access to Vault are the internal people to that utility. The only access the consultants have to the files are what is checked out into the Autodesk Construction Cloud and given them permission. I wanna talk about talent acquisition a little bit, and I think it's kind of been laced through the conversation a little bit, um, but it's a really important conversation to be had. You know, it was mentioned, you know, what are students learning in school and education. And a lot of these universities are teaching 3D design uh, right on the campus. These students come out and they wanna work with 3D. They wanna work with intelligent design. And that becomes very important to the utility because if you're stuck you know, in a graphic work design world and not an intelligent work design world, if I'm looking at this possible company to work for and I gotta be stuck in a proprietary tool and 2D design, it might not be where I wanna go. And as a utility, you want to be able to spotlight that really great talent. Again, I reiterate what we're accomplishing here as utility designers. We're building the grid of the future. And you don't want low ball designers coming in that say, oh, 2D is easy. Yeah, let me take this job, right? And then the high cost turnover of losing those people. So they may take the job, but if they're not working with the latest and greatest tech, they may leave. There's a cost turnover involved with that. Uh, also, if you're using technology that's very proprietary, then you, there's a whole training charge and a cost that goes in line with that. And then of course, 
you know, over the next few years. And we've actually already really been seeing it is this big retirement uh, that's happening over the last 10 years and probably into the next five to 10 years. So we have a lot of talent leaving organizations. So this really gets fueled even more. You really want the best talent designing your utility infrastructure. Don't get the bottom of the barrel people. And a lot of that is what kind of solutions you're working with. And what's really neat with some of our uh, utilities is the knowledge sharing. So if you're using AutoCAD Map th uh, 3D, you know, obviously it's just AutoCAD built on steroids with some GIS and a lot of things built underneath the hood. And of course you add a uh, AUD on top of that. Uh, you have a lot more power, but the interface with Civil 3D, Plant 3D, electrical and I'm, there's some other softwares out there and you know minus inventor and revit these softwares work very much the same way so a lot of utilities every six to eight weeks they have these designs tips and tricks meetings so generation group comes in civil group comes in your map 3d people come in your substation people come in and it's a really great opportunity to say hey like i figured these things out within the autocad interface and it's again it's a really neat opportunity when you choose that platform and the interfaces work the same to be able to knowledge share so I got one video behind that. There's a huge skills gap, not just in our area, and it's a national problem. The whole purpose of CTE, which is Career Technical Education, is that students should exit the program into high wage, high demand jobs. My coworker and I wrote a CTE revitalization grant to start an engineering program here at Sunset. We pulled together a advisory board made up of a bunch of different engineering firms in the area and brought them together and said, what do students need to learn? Our advisory board stressed how important 3D design and manufacturing is to them. They pointed out Fusion 360 and Autodesk, and we were like, okay, well, that sounds awesome. Let's take a look. Our Exploring Computer Science and Engineering class uses the Tinkercad 3D design tools. I love it. You can get designing on day one. When they are ready to take our actual CAD class, we start with Fusion 360. We really got to set ourselves up with a solid machine list. CNC machines, laser cutters, 3D printers, and one of the things that I really enjoy about Fusion 360 is that that is a very short on-ramp, and we really get to move through a lot of physical projects quickly because of how easy the software is to interact with. All of those things kind of natively live in Fusion 360. We're not teaching five different software packages. They all live in that one workflow. We're always adding, growing, and trying to find what the next coolest thing is gonna be and how will it tie in to make it so we can make even cooler things. Recently, the Beaverton School District had a particular challenge with our HVAC systems. There was a bushing that was failing and hard to replace, and so we used Fusion 360 to model that part up and print it on our 3D printers. They have been installed in several schools around the district at this point. They are working great. We think that over the next few years, we'll save about $5 million. We have students that go into many different fields of engineering, microelectronics, manufacturing, 3D modeling. One of the things I really love about our program is that no matter what path students choose after, leaving, they're going to find things in our program that are directly applicable. Whatever skill set they come in with, we're not only honoring that, but we're magnifying it and letting them grow to their full potential. I want to reiterate, that's high school. So this is actually a VR model of some underground infrastructure that was done a couple of years ago using a product we used to have called Stingray. And it's this idea that going into a VR setting, being able to actually see assets and design out of that is very, very feasible. And from work from home and all these remote jobs that are now, you know, pretty much as part of our existence, this has become more important than ever. And when it comes to things like VR, um, you know, there's a lot of opinions out there. I really view it. And if you guys remember when these smartphones came out, 
I mean, I had the one, the Windows one on the left there, and it was really clunky getting to the internet, listening to music. I mean, it worked, but it just took a lot of work to get where I wanted to be. But eventually, Apple released this thing called iPhone, and everything really just became really seamless. It became an extension. And I honestly think VR is going to get there. I think, you know, having these big glasses on for hours at a time really just doesn't make sense. Um, you know, and the rumor mill is, is that Apple is working on a... Uh, VR, AR headset goggles. So maybe they'll, maybe they'll hit a home run again with doing that. But what is really cool is we, we've decided to get back into VR in a very big way by purchasing a company called The Wild. So The Wild uh, has been using Autodesk software as far as like products and file formats within a VR uh, environment. And I'm just going to let this video run because it'll explain what they're doing better than I will. When it comes to designing built environments, there's always the potential for something to be missed. It could be a failed ADA clearance, an inaccessible maintenance hatch, or even a hidden pipe collision. These issues can lead to some pretty costly problem solving down the line. You need a place where everyone can experience the space together before construction has even started. That place is in the wild. An immersive collaboration platform for those in the building industry. With The Wild, you and your team can experience your projects together from anywhere in the world, allowing you to make faster, more informed decisions. When reviewing my BIM model, I can explore model data, make accurate measurements, and toggle layer visibility. Review prototypes as a scale model, or from human scale at one-to-one. -one. And while you're there, meet with other stakeholders and collaborate in real time just like you're on site, or simply leave a comment for later. Can we widen this window by six inches? What makes the wild particularly convenient is that it's compatible with the tools you're already using, like Revit, SketchUp, and BIM 360. It's the perfect workspace for architects, engineers, construction teams, and everyone in between. For me, it's the easiest way to eliminate design flaws and mitigate costly clashes before construction. Plus, you can also download the Wild app to a mobile device and view your model in context using augmented reality. Discover the best place for teams to present, collaborate, and review projects. Head into the Wild and experience it for yourself at thewild.com. So more to come on that. I'll be really excited when we can actually get you know some utilities involved with a lot more VR projects in the years to come. Uh, but a lot of exciting opportunity there. Okay. So to wrap this up, again, we talked about solutions. We talked about integration. We talked about how necessary it is to have good talent designing our infrastructure of the future. And with that, quality speed results increase. Costs go down. Uh, the only thing that's missing there is reliability. Reliability goes up. And being able to do this allows you to do those capital jobs much faster, right? So that leads to a more resilient infrastructure. And then for those IOUs, when it comes to total shareholder return, it's the ability to take that dollar much farther for utilities that are harnessing intelligent design. In closing, just want to share a few upcoming events with you. A lot of you know uh, Autodesk University in New Orleans uh, is coming up at the end of next month. We will have a utility summit Monday evening. I will tell you, though, those slots are almost filled. So if you have plans to be at Autodesk University, um, you know, reach out to us, let us know, and we can try to get your spot reserved, uh, and we'll just see what we can do to work with you. But yeah, it's, there's not that many spots left. Uh, additionally, I will actually be teaching a session on LiDAR scanning with the iPhone and iPad. So I worked with Amarin, uh, my previous employer. We went into a control house and did some LiDAR scanning. I'm going to give you a sneak peek of this a little bit. Uh, to take mesh models bring them into the office and actually tie these to existing 2D wiring drawings. So we put a whole vault workflow into this. When you open up the DWG, the recap file shows up, so you actually get that model. We did some stuff with AR on this too, so it's going to be a really fun session. So if you do, you do get down there, get signed up for that. That is actually filling up fast. There's 147 attendees already signed up for a Wednesday morning. Uh, so I can only count maybe on half of them showing up. If you are there, a little tip on AU, if there is a session that's full, don't give up on that. 
uh, go to the entrance because if not everyone shows up, they will let you in. So if you are signed up for AU and you're like, oh, the session's full, uh, if you really want to get in there, just stand outside the door and wait and see if it ever even hits capacity. Uh, myself and SBS, we're going to do a webinar in October 19th specifically, and we're going to talk about that transition from graphic work design to intelligent work design and how we're going to be creating the digital twins of the utility infrastructure networks of the future. So if you can't attend that, and if you can't attend that, just also another tip as well, Autodesk webinars, uh, it's a simple link, autodesk.com forward slash webinars. You can go and view a webinar you may have missed. You do have to sign up to get access to it, um, but there is no cost involved with that. And you can go back and watch all the webinars we've done <laughs> as far back as you want to go. So that is what I have for you this morning. Is there any questions and answers? Anything anybody wants to chat about? Any thoughts? Yes. Do you need the Autodesk Vault to use the construction cloud? Nope, not at all. It yes. can operate independently. Okay, yep. thank you. Oh man, I get, I get afraid when Sergey asks a question. <laughs> Uh, it's not a question, just a comment. Oh. <laughs> so, um, just for your information, Utility Data Hub EIM module, you're going to see it tomorrow, have a direct connection, has a direct connection to Autodesk Construction Cloud. So effectively, it uh, kind of uh, another way of storing data, uh, storing design drawings in a cloud, uh, supporting versioning and control and uh, folders, everything in uh, Autodesk Construction Cloud. Mr. Dave, uh, yes, sir. Yeah, uh, can you speak to uh, the Autodesk Tandem application and uh, where that fits in all this? Boy, um, not thoroughly. <laughs> I, I had a, I have a video showcase on here of it, and you know, in a nutshell, and don't quote me on this, but really, it's it's a single source of bringing all your model data together in one place for handoff. So if you have civil design, you have Revit architecture going on. Uh, you know, maybe you have some wiring data that's in full 3D digital twin. It's the idea that you're not sending various file formats of this data, but Tandem combines all of it for one digital delivery. I think that's what the pamphlet says. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, but essentially, it's what it is. It's one digital delivery, but I don't have a whole lot of specifics to, to break down into that because I didn't. everything's kind of in the architectural zone for that. So I haven't had a chance to really see how it correlates in the utility world yet. But great question. Yes. I'll hit that a little bit in that. Um, so when we started with the digital twin at Autodesk, they, <clears throat> I went to them. In fact, the utilities were some of the first ones that were interested. And we went to our team. And they're like, the utilities aren't going to do anything for five or six years. Um, now it's like they've come back to us and they said, all the utilities want to talk about digital twin. So there's now a dedicated digital twin. I don't know if you want to call it, what would you call it, a group or team that, yeah. that addresses a lot of the digital twin stuff. So um, if that helps you a little bit. In fact, Jack talked about the wild a little bit before. Um, the entire utilities, Autodesk Utilities team is in this room, all three of us, um, that are dedicated to utilities. And we get a lot of grief because, oh, you know, your customers are five or six years behind or three or four years behind. So anybody that wants to do anything new, like cutting edge, let us know, you know? And Jared knows how to yeah. find us. and. And um, Stefan knows how to find us, so let us know. We'd love to be cutting edge with some of that stuff. Yep. Yeah. I do want to tag on a little bit to Derek's uh, comment, too. From a digital twin standpoint, you know, when I mentioned it yesterday, but when you are designing, you are creating a digital twin. So it's 3D, it's got topology, it has all those capabilities. Are we on, by the way? Yeah, and, and uh, so you do have that digital twin capability already, and then the next aspect of it is the storage of the digital twin. And, you know, I think, Derek, you've seen it. We're doing more of this on the substation side because it's so much more equipment and asset management intensive, quite frankly. But we've developed a forge-based framework for storaging, storing and managing those digital twins. So if that's of interest to you, we would be happy to set up a session for you and just go over it. We, it's, it's in a very good position, technically, from a development standpoint. We just haven't released it to the market because, quite frankly, we're looking for some early adopter customers that really, like you said, are interested in digital twins and want to work, work with us to take the product, uh, get it from 0.9 to 1.0. So, so uh, please reach out. We'd be 
absolutely delighted to talk to you about it. Yeah, you know, for for those folks that might have some docs going on or are working in ACC, a lot of the AutoCAD menus have a direct docs work button. So you can be working straight from docs if you want to, as an example. So you don't even have to be on your hard drive for that.